All right. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to today's uh, architecture session. Uh, my name is Stanley Philippe. I'm a member of Carlton's recruitment team. I um, hope you're having a beautiful um, Saturday and that you're enjoying our virtual follow-up in house. A lot of great conversations I've been having that we've been having uh, throughout the day and continue to do so, of course, today. Uh, we've got a really great video uh, to show you uh, of a presentation that took place a couple weeks ago on campus, actually, uh, as part of our Fall Open House series. And so that's gonna be a great chance for you to hear a bit more about you know, the portfolio, the, the structure of the program, and, and understand more what, what architecture is all about at Carleton. Uh, but while we do that, and, and during the video um, kind of session, uh, you'll notice that there is a Q&A function uh, that's available. So if you have any questions that you wanna ask, uh, myself, my colleague Kira uh, Bloomfield, uh, who's a member of our engineering recruitment team, and uh, and our awesome student, soon to be graduate, um, Oliver, is also here um, to answer some of your questions you may have about getting into architecture, navigating the program, some of the different options that are available to you. So please, please feel free to uh, to utilize that Q&A uh, throughout uh, our session. But before I click play, I, I wanted to give Oliver an opportunity to share a bit more about um, his experience, you know, since they've just recently, well, they're about to graduate pretty soon. So um, Oliver, maybe you can tell us a bit about what it was like uh, being a student in yeah. architecture uh, before we start. Yeah, um, there's so many amazing things, it's hard to even say where to start. But yeah, um, I'm just waiting to graduate. I've basically finished all of my classes, so I can speak to the whole program. Um, and I did the design stream um, as well, specifically. So one of the big things that stands out to me about my time at Carleton Architecture is just how much hands-on stuff we got to do. Um, so I feel like I'm really familiar with 3D printers and laser cutters, um, with 3D modeling, with all sorts of design software, um, and how designs look when you print them, all sorts of things like that. Um, yeah, there's lots to get excited about there. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, well, thanks for that. And again, Oliver will be available uh, to answer some of your questions. So uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to uh, play this video and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the content. And uh, again, please uh, utilize uh, the Q&A to ask us your questions. Okay, here we go. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Bordo. I'm an associate professor and I'm the associate director of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. So I have a presentation that's going to go through kind of what you can expect if you apply to our school, the portfolio requirements, and all of that type of information to help you on your way with an application. Um, so to first give a little bit of background. If you need to contact anyone at the school, here are the two contacts. Um, one is myself. Uh, so if you have any questions about applications, you know, you can you can reach out to me. Um, I ask that if you send an email that you also copy in our undergraduate administrator. Our undergraduate administrator knows absolutely everything there is to know about how to apply to the school. You know? So she is your very, very, very best contact. Um, sometimes people think that if they contact the director that they'll get a faster or better response. That typically isn't true. The director, while she's completely aware of admissions, defers admissions to Michelle and I. So because of that, if you need to email or contact us, we are your two best resources. Our admission requirements are English, physics, and advanced functions. Uh, and then what we do is that we take your next three highest uh, for you or for M courses, so that we do a total of six grades. Um, now, we calculate the overall average. The minimum cutoff to apply to the program is 74 to 76%, but we usually admit students with much, much higher uh, uh, ranges. You know, we'd like kind of in the mid eighties and with strong portfolios. Now, the way that that works is that if you have a phenomenal portfolio, will be a little bit more generous on the grades. If you are an incredibly smart student, we can allow for a slightly weaker portfolio, but you know we're kind of in that range of good portfolios, smart students, um, because we are one of the most competitive programs, um, well, well, certainly at Carleton, but also as far as architecture programs are concerned in the province. 
Now, Carleton has these incredible entrance scholarships. I'm, I'm hoping, because I haven't done this presentation in one and a half years uh, in person, I'm hoping that this information is still correct. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Perfect. So, if you come into our program and you've got an 80 to 84.9 average, you're going to get $1,000 a year for the four years that you do your undergraduate study. Now, my understanding on this is that it's renewable at A minus. So what that means is let's say you move into residence, you have a little bit of a tough time adjusting, your average is slightly lower than you expected. What, may, what that means is you get your average back up and the money comes back. So you don't have to go home at Christmas and explain to your parents that not only did you have a bad term, but you also lost cash. You, know, you can say, I'll work extra hard in the winter term and I'll get it all back. Yeah. So this is an incredibly generous thing that we have. If you are an exceptional student in the 95 to 100 range, that means $4,000 for four years. That is almost half of your tuition paid for. These are key dates. So here we are um, on the 16th in a uh, you know, week and a half, we'll have a BAS open house. In all honesty, uh, you'll hear very much the same information. Uh, so, so, you know, but what that allows you to do is to meet students. And if you're interested in any of the three majors that we have, and I'll explain that a little bit later, you can talk with them and say, what's it like being at Carleton? You know, what's residence like? Where did you live uh, after your first or second year? And you can have that type of a conversation. So that's the advantage to the open house. We also have design days, and then we have another open house in December. That one in December is geared towards people that are kind of halfway through their application and they go like, I don't really understand what you meant by X. And then we can kind of walk you through that. We don't typically look at portfolios. And the reason why is, is that we have 730 applicants per year and we just don't have the, 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 the kind of bandwidth to make space for that number of people that have so many questions about portfolios. But um, these open houses are an amazing resource to be able to get kind of all of your questions answered. So if you're interested in our program, those are dates that are important for you. So why Carleton? Ottawa is a kind of a wonderful city. Um, you know, it's maybe slightly quieter than, than Toronto, but what there are a number of advantages to being in our nation's capital. We have absolutely incredible cultural institutions. We have access to really remarkable kind of professionals. Um, and then there's our campus, you know? So you did get a little bit wet today. Uh, that's because, are the tunnels closed? Yeah. Yeah, that's why. So right now our campus, for those that don't want to go out in the bad weather is not really optimized. But hopefully when you come back in September, the tunnels will be back open, which means and if I can use my cursor here, the architecture building is this red building right here. We are at the moment uh, in the pavilions, which is right here. Residence is in gray, and all of these lines are the tunnels that connect every building on campus. So if it's cold or if it's rainy, you can just roll out of bed and you can rock into the tunnels and you can be into your classroom five minutes later. You never have to see the outdoors if you don't want to. Uh, these tunnels collect you, connect you also to athletics, uh, to the library. And then the, the thing that's currently under construction, but hopefully they'll pick up the pace, is that it connects to the O train line. And of course, the, bus, the buses are running. So what that means is that we're an incredibly nice, compact campus. And if you want to live further afield in your second or third year, you've got a couple friends, you want to rent a house, what you do is you can go anywhere around here, in here, and now that the O train line also goes east west, you can live anywhere in that T and you can get onto campus in about you know 15 minutes. And so that makes it very convenient also to kind of live here and work here and uh, get you know an architectural education. Our facilities. Our building is a tough love. A lot of people when they see it for the first time, they go, whoo, that's an architecture building. Pretty, pretty ugly. But it is an absolute beloved building. And I'd be lying if I didn't say architecturally, it's actually very, very important. In the history of architecture, this is the 
best purpose-built school of architecture in what's called the Canadian brutalist style. So while it is not a historic monument, it really ought to be. But the thing is, is that in that tough shell are some incredible spaces. So we have this pit. This is the heart of the school. When we're in person, this is where there's lectures, events. I've seen people kind of kicking a soccer ball around here late at night. This is the place where people have reviews and they come and they meet. And it is the very social heart of the school. We have the studios. These studios are light filled. Uh, everybody gets a desk. You can see it becomes a creative mess very, very quickly. But this is where you get projects and we say, you know, design uh, and you work for a couple of weeks on a project to design whatever the brief is. Now, in your first year, the projects are quite small. And then as you go through the program, they become larger and larger and larger. And this is to prepare you for professional practice. And it's also to prepare you for your graduate school applications. We have public spaces called these streets. So on the ground floor, there's one street that goes uh, to the east-west. You go up a level, the other one goes north-south to where they cross. You can kind of look down and you can see the entire building. So you can see what's going on, which is always really fantastic. And in these streets, we have kind of public presentations. If there's a little pinup or something like that, that's where these happen. So because of that, by walking the halls, you can see all of the things that are going on in the school. We have incredible workshop uh, and assembly room facilities. So this is our wood shop. These machines are from the day that the building opened. They are built <laughs> so well that they can last if we take care of them for another 50 years. But because of that, this is all at your disposal. We have welding rooms, we have metal bending, we have wood shops, and then we also have increased. So that here you see a couple of students working on their project. We have photo labs, CNC mill machines, 3D printers, and we have a full print shop. Uh, we also have laser cutters uh, as well. Um, we have an awesome robot, uh, but that's for research. But we're just putting in funding. Uh, and if, if that comes through, uh, then we'll have a, a full robot lab as well. And so that would then be for, for research, but we'll allow students, if the project warrants it, to come in. So we are trying to, to build kind of the most sophisticated um, technology labs that we have in Canada. We have a gallery. Here we have shows, sometimes they're student shows. And so what we do is we bring really, really great projects from, from, from around the world here so that students can see what other students are doing. Um, but what we also do is that we bring in kind of incredible artists from all over. Um, and in this way, you know, we improve the, the kind of cultural vitality of our program. We have the forum and open forum lecture series. This is where we bring in amazing professionals. They talk to you about what it's like to be in the profession. They share their incredible work. And we are one of two schools that has a um, kind of school publication called Building 22. The other program is the University of Manitoba. Um, so this is uh, a yearbook of the best work that happens every single year. Uh, and so it is run by students, it's edited uh, and curated by students. But if you get into this, uh, it's a real achievement because it means that your project was deemed to be one of the very, very best of that year. So I kind of touched on this earlier, but this is really important. Um, we have three majors in our program, and they are very distinctive. They start. We all start together in the first year, but then after that, we kind of braid to the fourth year. The first one is conservation and sustainability. And so it really is about the preservation and adaptive transformation of existing building stock. So what does that mean? The majority of buildings in Canada have already been built. And so the question is, what do we do with all of these buildings? How do we transform them for the next 50 years? Should we take the wrecking ball and knock them all down to the ground and throw that all in the landfill? Given our current climate crisis, the answer to that is a clear and resonant no. So then the question is, what do we do with this stuff? 
stuff that might actually have had past industrial uses that need, you know, that have that are contaminated, and all of these things. Conservation and sustainability looks at how to retrofit, to recycle, and to rejuvenate those projects. So a lot of people think that conservation is always like just really beautiful old buildings. That's part of it. So what you see going on on Parliament Hill right now is a preservation conservation project. But really, the stuff that happens more in Canada is how to transform, let's say, like warehouses into new use, or how to take, uh, let's say, an office building that no longer has tenants and maybe convert that to another form, uh, maybe housing, uh, maybe something institutional. And so that really is what conservation and sustainability is about. They look at existing buildings. So this is a, a little project that someone did for 24 Sussex Drive, which 18 months ago was a really contentious issue. People were wondering if they should just knock it down and build a new one. You know, is it worth the money uh, to, to, to spend you know, the $50 million that's needed to, to retrofit it? Other people say, no, it's the prime minister's house. It's really important. Other people say that architecturally, it's actually a completely uninteresting and indistinct house. So let's actually build something special. And these are the type of conversations that would happen in conservation and sustainability. Then we have design. Design is what you would consider to be your more kind of bread and butter architecture program. So this is looking at how we can collectively enhance the quality of life through improvements of the built environment. Architecture really looks at kind of breaking down the idea of a building into some uh, into kind of a web of, of parts. So the first is site, where is the building located? Uh, then there's a program, what will it be used for? Fancy word is tectonics, how it will be built. Systems, so this is all the techno stuff of, of how the environment, the internal environment is going to be moderated. And then the context. The context is really, really important because it's the social, cultural, and environmental forces that shape a building. So. COVID has caused a really, really interesting thing about context. The thing about context is that families right now in this room are sitting two meters apart. This has never happened before. That is a contextual problem. How do you design a lecture theater that can maybe accommodate these types of different situations? Currently, the smartest thing that we've come up with is a series of green check marks. Industrial designers, architects, engineers can come up, let's say, with smarter solutions if the time and the money and the inclination is there to warrant it. At the moment, we're hopeful that in a couple months' time, we can rip off all of these green check marks and we never have to worry about this problem again. But if it is something that continues, then it's going to become a really urgent architectural problem. How do we allow for this constant shift of occupancy because of, let's say, public health regulations. So those are kind of some of the smaller contextual things that happen uh, that, that allow us to think you know, critically about building. And that makes buildings and designing buildings so interesting because it's constantly changing. And so why have we been designing houses for the last, you know, well, architects have only been designing houses for the last 500 years, but why have we been designing and building houses for thousands of years? Why are we still constantly tinkering with it? Like if you were an engineer, you'd say, how could you not have figured this out already? Like you've had all of this time, but it's because we have to deal with culture, we have to deal with society, we have to deal with social factors that allow one person to say, I'm not sure, I actually kind of want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. And it allows us to do an ongoing kind of transformation of the built environment. This is a little project, again, just to throw a visual in there. Um, the reason why I choose this one, it's kind of a lovely drawing. It's a bit soft. If the lights were off, you'd see it uh, far more clearly. But also, I think that it's an important drawing to show because you see the, the, what's called the section at the bottom, which is a, a kind of a cut through the building so that you can see all of the technical requirements. So you can see the foundation, you can see the floors, you can see kind of all of the structure that's needed to hold this thing up. Uh, which kind of is an indication that, yes, we are a program that very, very much loves the arts uh, and the creation of kind of beautiful stuff. But if you can't be built, if it doesn't work, then, you know, 
we haven't done our job properly. So this project kind of balances very, very nicely the requirements of, of, of the technical requirements of building with, let's say, a, a very creative uh, expression of what a building in the landscape might be. Then we have urbanism. Um, to be completely forthright, urbanism is probably the most misunderstood of our three majors. And so because of that, it's really, really important that I stick here for, for, for a moment. Urbanism is the design of cities. To be really, really clear about it, our success in climate change is going to really deal with how well we design and transform cities. If we get it wrong, then we'll continue kind of to really struggle with meeting the targets that we need to meet. If we get it right, we start to consider kind of sustainable development. Uh, if we understand kind of, uh, you know, stewardship of the built environment, then we actually have a pretty okay-ish chance of slowly mitigating this crisis over time. And so cities need to be better designed. It's not just buildings, but we have to think of this in a really systemic way. Now, if you really like thinking about things like systems, infrastructure, how that works, then urbanism is kind of your thing. You know, if you're not too interested in like the little details of a building, but you want to understand neighborhoods or entire regions, then urbanism is, is kind of more your thing. And so this is a place where you get to think about the really, really big picture of stuff. And so, you know, that is another way that uh, we need to design. Canada has historically not had a very strong um, urban design field. You know, it's, not, it's not something that, that's really in the American or in the Canadian consciousness or in the American consciousness for that matter. You know, we kind of build because we've got all the land that we could possibly ever use. We can build because we have all of the resources that we could possibly want. And yet we're starting to come up against that inflection point where we realize, man, it'd be really great if we'd done this better. And so that's where we're up against now. So urbanism is an incredibly urgent, um, urgent field, but I would say it's an emerging one. So here you have someone that's kind of looking at these blocks um, and how you know they, they might communicate with one another uh, to create a, a more responsive urban environment. Career opportunities. We have just a really, really great design degree. So for students that are, you know kind of interested, but at the end, maybe in second, third year, they're like, oh man, you know, is there, is there other things that I can kind of do with this degree? Um, you know, here's a list of stuff that is possible. So for conservation and sustainability, you can become an adaptive reuse architect, a sustainable design consultant, a historic building inspector. You can work at foundations like the World Monuments Fund or ICOMOS. You can work at the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. You can become a social activist. Or an accessibility architect. If you follow design, you could, if you really like the theoretical parts of it, become a historian, a journalist, or a writer critic. If you like more the building aspect of it, you can become a contractor, an inspector. And then there's all of the creative fields that are available to you. So you can become, you know, any form of designer. So we've had people go into interior design, lighting, set. We've had people go into fashion, furniture, graphic, exhibition design. We've had people become facilities managers, illustrators, kind of landscape architects. So I want everyone here to kind of recognize that if you go into the design field, it's not that the only thing that you can do at the end of that is become an architect. You know, architect is one of the things which two thirds of our students continue on. But that other third, they say, like, this was really great, but we're going to go do something else and, and off they go. Kind of the best example was that there was a student that in their second year actually came up and said, look, I want to finish my degree, but I'm actually way more interested in animation. Like, what can I do? And I said, okay, well, let's change some of your electives around. So we'll make these animation electives, which are also at Carlton, we'll make them actually electives for you. And you'll take these studios with these people so you can do those types of projects. And in the last term that you have, you'll be with me. 
and I'll let you do whatever project you want so that you can get into animation school when you leave. He became the uh, content curator for Paw Patrol within two weeks of leaving our program. He became the only non-Sheridan College graduate to work for that company. Went all the way up, then all of a sudden decided Nickelodeon poached him, he started his own program, and now he's doing content for Nickelodeon. That's possible because the skills that you learn here are transferable to other fields. So if you're not entirely sure about architecture halfway through your education, it's okay. We can pick you up and we can parachute you into other things as well. We have co-op. We're trying to grow co-op. We want more students to take it, uh, but it's currently that you do four work terms. Uh, and so that's a total, actually that's incorrect, sorry. Uh, it's three work terms for a total 12 months of experience. Uh, but it's over a 16 month period of time. So why 16 months? Well, because our school year ends, let's say May 1st, and you've got a summer that takes you to September, and then you have a full academic year, which takes you back to September. So if you add that all up, that's 16 months. So let's say the economy isn't it's, it's a little shaky, um, or you'd like a little break after your third year, um, you can take a month off, get a job, let's say midway through the summer, you have lots of time to complete your co-op experience, and then you come back. Now, the one thing that it obviously does, is if you leave for a year to work, it takes your uh, four-year undergraduate degree to five years. But in that time, you've learned incredible experience, you've made a little bit of money, um, and when you finish your fourth year, often those students go back to the firm where they just worked at eight months before, they get picked up again, and maybe work for a year or two in practice before continuing with grad school. Right? So it's a really, really nice way of, of, of getting that to work. Now for co-op, we have a co-op office. Uh, that co-op office is in contact with uh, firms in Canada. And so, you know, we, we do have a relationship that way. But a lot of students, you know, you can go anywhere you want. So if, if they want to go back and experience something abroad, uh, we support them in that, but nine out of 10 times, they kind of have to do a little bit of homework themselves to, to, to find and land that job. Obviously, we don't walk up to you and say, you know, you start here on Monday. Um, what it is, is that you have to go for an interview and like all kind of job applications, you have to impress. But because we're a competitive program, because we take smart students, because we need them to have a CGPA that's above a B plus, our students that are in the program almost always land a job. And so I should also say that it's so different from some other co-op programs. It is paid work. This isn't volunteerism. Um, so we're not going to send you to New York and let you write and say, yeah, I got a job. It's paid at $150 a month. Uh, you know, I'm only going additionally into debt for another 2000 as I get a small little studio somewhere, you know, in Yonkers. That's not for us what's paid employment. No, it's, it's a living wage. We have directed studies abroad. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity in third year. We have two opportunities in third year. One is that you just go on a fantastic study trip. You know, this is for kind of 10 days. We throw you on a plane somewhere, uh, you land, um, and you are meeting professionals, you're going to sites, you're checking out buildings. This is a study trip. But we have sent people all over Europe, China, Japan, India. We're looking at how we can start to, to kind of rein it in a little bit so that everyone can have that opportunity to, to maybe put a, a, a cap on costs uh, and that you know those costs up front and beforehand. Um, but uh, this is a kind of an amazing educational experience for those that, that, that have it. Now, for those students that, let's say, don't want to travel abroad for whatever reason, we don't ever ask this, that's kind of personal to you, there is always a group that stays at home. But the trip is only 10 days long, kind of bookended between two weekends and the reading week of the winter term for third year. So, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of easy to just hang out and then your classmates come back and you continue with the studio. We also have international exchange. 
This is kind of far more elaborate, but it's where you go uh, for an entire term to study at another university. So we have relationships with Monash, with Paris Malique, with the Technion in Haifa. Uh, we have also Kujulu Natal, and then Madrid, Liverpool, and Montreux University in, in the UK. And so what happens here is that you apply for that early, you get accepted, and then for an entire term, you go and you study at that place. The reason why we pick these places is because their curriculum is very similar to ours in quality and in content. So what that means is that you might have to take one course that you can't find credit for, but when you come back, you just go straight into fourth year. You know, and you can do that course in the summer or whatever. We, we make that available to you. But so it's a really, really wonderful way if you want a kind of broadened experience that you can study at another university for four months. We have student groups. The oldest and most established one is the Architectural uh, Student Association, the Israeli Architectural Student Association, ASA. They're the ones that kind of plan events. They're also the one that liaise uh, with our faculty board. So if there's an issue, they're the ones that kind of contact us, we contact them. Their student representatives sit on our faculty board. So they're at every open meeting to kind of understand how the school works. So that's kind of the, the general liaise. We also have a student well-being committee, a diversity working group, and the architecture lobby. The architecture lobby deals with environmental concerns. So now about the kind of bread and butter of, of what this application thing is all about. Last year, we received 730 applications. We made 200 offers to accept 100 students. We accept 60 in design, 20 in urbanism, and 20 in conservation and sustainability. This stuff is all due March 1st, and it's due right before midnight. I think we put 11.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There's two written components, uh, and I'll explain them in a second. One is a brief CV, and the other one is a short description. And then there's visual components, which is what really everyone's always interested about. But I would say that it's the written components that you should be equally kind of invested in. You will write something every day of your life, whether it's a text or a memo or an email or a paper or a response or something, you know. And so the written component is really, really important. You know, for a professional going into an office, you have to be able to communicate clearly and you have to be able to understand and parse out when a quick text is okay and when you need to be kind of far more formal. Now we're in the application process quite open to the breadth of kind of creative thinking that writing can entail. But I would say, you know, take your time, make sure there's no spelling mistakes, have proper grammar, just do all the due diligence that you would expect for someone that's applying to a university program. So the first part of the uh, exercise, the written exercise is an applicant description. It's a brief CV. The CV is just a list of five, no more, no less, of your academic, uh, athletic, and artistic accomplishments. So if you played on your high school volleyball team and went to the city finals twice, you know, and that's something you're really proud of. You worked hard on it. And it's something that you, that you committed to. Tell us about it. We want to know that. If you learned how to draw from your grandparents and you, you know, went every summer to their house and you went into the woods and you kind of just drew and painted and sketched and all of that type of stuff. And that's why you love drawing. Tell us about that. Um, what we're looking for is just the thing, one, what makes you a unique candidate? What makes you different from other people? And two, kind of what are the things that you're committed to? If you're like, oh yeah, I you know one year I went to basketball camp, the next year I went to badminton, that's not interesting or important to us. It just means that you kind of bounced around and you never really picked one of them. But if there's something that you're like, I did dance or ballet since I was four years old and I did it for 16 years. It's like, that's cool. Yeah. 
that was your time. You know, we don't expect students to be working on architecture right now. You're not studying architecture. So you're doing other stuff. So let us know. The short description is why you're a strong candidate. Why conservation and sustainability? Why design? Why urbanism? And this is a really important question because oftentimes we get like, I'm really interested in design. We're like, okay. They're like, the city is so important. You know, if we mess up designing cities, then, then we're like, well, but you said design, but you're writing about urbanism. So there's like a disconnect there. So we're like, is this candidate actually applying to the correct major? So then I have in the past kind of written recruitment or admissions doesn't like that. So like, don't reach out to anyone. And they're like, you're a really strong candidate. Uh, do you mean design or do you mean urbanism? You know, and they're like, oh, I mean design. It's like, oh no, <laughs> I was hoping it's urbanism because all you've done is write about urbanism. But this is where, you know, we try to figure out and get people into the right spot. You know, now let's say, you come into the program and you're like, oh man, this is not what I wanted at all. You know, I want that one over there. I want conservation and sustainability. There is a transfer of major process, but it's competitive. It's tough. And we might only allow one or two people to transfer a year. So because of that, it really is best if you just make it into the one you want right off the bat. Don't think, okay, I'm going to try to you know, game the system and I'm going to go for the one that I think is easy to get into. And then I'm going to see if I can transfer later. It's like, no, we don't, we don't try to play that game. Right? So if you're interested in one, that's the one you go for. Then we have the essay questions. These questions are a bit weird. They're a bit different. They're intended to make you think. What it really is, is that we're hoping is that you can't just take an essay that you wrote for English class like three months before, change the title and submit it to us, right? We want you to have a position on this stuff. Tell us what you think, you know? Tell us what you've experienced. Tell us what you know. And so there might be a little bit of work that needs to be done, you know? So, so at least Khalil Gibran, uh, who's Shannon Matern, you know, what does that even mean? Um, you know, what is this book, Code and Play, Data and Dirt? You know, can I find actually a little synopsis of that book online, go into Amazon, act like you're going to buy it, read the thing, and kind of move on? You know, all of these things is kind of perfectly fine. But because of that, again, like I said, the written word is important. So take your time with this stuff. Now we get to the visual stuff, the drawings. You'll be sending up to eight images to us. Four of them are mandatory, four of them are optional. So because of that, you can get into our program having just sent the four mandatory images. We have six themes for you to choose from. So if you read through it and you're like, you know, I'm not really interested in the reconsidering the existing, that, that, no, that's not for me, fine. You can have another one that you kind of slough off but you have to do four of them. And so this is again, intended to make you think, it's to kind of prompt you different things. Now people say, what are the things that you like? Well, we like to know what you think as a response to these prompts. Now, the best thing that you can do is start early. Let's say you look at the one and you say the world around you. Oh yeah, the yeah. world around me right now. It's, it's COVID, it's COVID, it's COVID, it's COVID. Write it down, put it in your drawer for a week, and then come back to it. The reason why I say that is that the first response that you have is probably the response that 300 other people are going to have. And if we have to pick between what is the best of 300 COVID pictures that respond to the world around you, then that's going to be tough. If on the other hand, take a look and you go, actually, I'm going to go slightly closer to home. Is there something happening in my neighborhood? Is there something that's happening in my family? Is there something that's happening with my friends? Is there something that's happening in my school? And I'm going to maybe respond to that. Obviously, you know, you don't have to disclose anything, uh, but so, you know, family, ask parents maybe first. 
But the thing is, is that what we're trying to get to is kind of a really nuanced, thoughtful, intelligent kind of content in an image. And so because of that, this will take a little bit of planning. And so, yes, world around you, something made, you know, come up with that. And you might a week later say, no, that's exactly the thing that I want to do. But just remember, you are in a pool of 730 other people that are exactly at the same stage of their life. You know? And so because of that, you really, again, need to, to parse out how you can become a unique candidate. Or optionals, images can be anything. So this is where we put photography, digital work. Some people have done sewing, embroidery, fashion, building. If you're dance, theater, submit a photo of you in a, in a performance. Um, and so that's that stuff. One of the coolest things I've ever seen was someone that made uh, fly fishing reels, like hooks. And in one photo, they had all of the stuff that they used. So there's like pheasant feathers and other types of things, kind of the hooks and the yarn, this. It was all beautifully laid out. And then the next photo, it was all finished. They were fantastic. It was beautiful. And it's like, okay, this person knows how to make something. You know, that's their thing. They like going fishing on the weekend. We're interested in that. Someone uh, was making instruments. That's cool. Birchwood canoes with their parents. That's cool. Um, and then other people, it's, it's kind of just, you know, they went on a trip and they are just really, really good at taking beautiful photos. I will say a caution about photos. Though. There's a difference between a good photo and a photo of a good experience. So you go down to Cabo, see this amazing sunset. You love the trip. Food was fantastic, happy, got you into the warm weather in the middle of March. You take that photo of the sunset. That is a photo of a good experience. It's not necessarily a good photo. We get hundreds of Cabo sunset pictures because people have just a really good vibe about that time. They're like, oh, that was so awesome. I love that picture. That picture reminds me of everything that was good about that trip. We don't see it that way. We're looking at composition. We're looking at color. We're looking at how you framed it, you know? And so because of that, people put in a lot of photos and some of them are good, many of them aren't. So if you have actually another drawing, it might just be better to put that in instead. So just really, really, really look critically at your work, you know? So and just be really mindful about what we're looking for. Uh... Okay, yeah, no, so this is the second to last slide. The last thing that I want to mention about the portfolio is that you submit in a online platform called Slide Room. Slide Room is, for any of you from your generation, super simple to use. It's kind of like Instagram, you post images, type little annotations, all of that type of stuff, right? Until you hit submit, it's with you. So if you want to trade things out, all of that stuff is fine. The thing with Slide Room is that as a, an American program, you need to sign up for it. And that costs a couple of bucks. Uh, last time I checked, it was $10 US. So you'll need a credit card. And a problem that we run into quite often is that students wait until the very, very end. The parents are out. They can't get a credit card. They're scrambling to sign up for slide room, to be able to submit their application and they can't. And then we get a panic email at around 1125 asking if they can get an extension. Now, nine out of 10 times we give people an extension, it's okay. But it would just be much better if you just, if you know you're going to apply, sign up for it today. And then you never have to worry about that again, right? And then what you can do is you can, kind of figure out how the whole thing works. It is easy, but you can kind of get used to it. And you put up a couple of images already, maybe your four optional images, maybe you're in an amazing arts program right now. And you're just like, I've got that stuff already done. Okay, put that up. And then take time also to write annotations and to kind of give descriptions of stuff. You can give descriptions of things about a hundred words. 
And then the last one is for all of those that are maybe a little bit younger, grade 10 or 11, uh, we have Imagine Architecture. And this is a uh, summer camp that's for grade 10 to grade 12 students that are interested in architecture. Maybe you're on the fence. Uh, there was a family before, didn't quite know if it was going to be architecture or architectural engineering. Um, what they could do is that they could uh, sign up for one of these courses. You can come into our, we're hoping that next year is in person. Come into the school, do a project with a couple of people that are also in high school from different parts of the country, uh, and you figure out if this is the thing you want to do. Like if you're not quite sure, then this is a, a perfect way to find out if one, architecture is the thing you want to study, and two, if Carleton is the place where you want to study. And so, you know, that's the, the, the plug for the Imagine Architecture program, which has been running for, for five years since, you know, kind of gone from strength to strength. So that's all right, folks. So that was uh, a brief, uh, I guess, somewhat brief, uh, forty-four minute uh, introduction to our program. Now there have been some really good questions that have been asked uh, in the chat, uh, which is great, and uh, we'll we'll stay online for a couple more minutes to answer some of those questions too. But um, Oliver, and I see you're back on screen. Thanks for doing that. Um, I was yeah. wondering if you can maybe talk a bit about. Um, there was a question that was asked about uh i'm trying to find a question here uh yeah i've been madly yeah, typing been away at different responses <laughs> yeah like and there are a lot a lot of questions about the portfolio itself uh which i think was yeah. uh, was talked about here but how do you know whether or not your skill set mm -hmm. will translate well when you get into this program um i think that if you're the type of person who really cares about detail and attention to detail um and making everything just so then that's definitely a plus for sure because you do need to be pouring over this um 3d detailed work that you're making and really be polished about everything um so yeah you need that patience um but other than that there's so many different ways that you can take this and the profs really give you so much freedom um that you can sort of explore whatever you're passionate about really they yeah. like it when you break the rules as long as you have a good reason to <laughs> yes i love i love that yes rule breakers are acceptable if the reason for breaking that rule is also acceptable um i think what we'll do is uh we'll we'll stop there um so this will be the end of our kind of formal uh on camera uh, presentation, uh, but please, um, you know, that we're going to stick around for a couple more minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q and A and then, uh, we'll continue to answer your questions directly. So a uh, big thanks to everyone for attending this session. Uh, if you're attending more sessions this afternoon, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, if you're not, I hope you had a really great virtual follow up and health day. And, uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you at Carleton in the fall. Um, so take care everyone. Thanks.